This is lecture three of our Chem 344 spectroscopy series. Uh, today we're going to talk about primarily mass spectrometry. Uh, the title slide up here shows us that we're also going to talk about a technique very briefly, a technique of gas chromatography, GC. We're going to ultimately see how GC and mass spectrometry, MS, are combined to provide a very powerful technique. You'll see that certainly in the, in the course. You'll also see it in the a practice problem set that is associated with this lecture. So we're going to start off with uh, a very brief overview of uh, the idea behind gas chromatography, but the vast majority of this lecture is going to be concentrated on mass spectrometry, and we'll be talking about how we generate species known as molecular ions, uh, which are a very important uh, part of the uh, experiment, and how those molecular ions fragment in order to give us uh, information about the connectivity of a molecule. In a complementary way, to the connectivity information we can get from NMR spectroscopy. I'm going to start talking about now, in general, chromatography. Um, this is a technique that is taught at high school. It's uh, typically associated with some kind of color. And ultimately, it's the separation of a mixture into its individual components. It's a very powerful uh, thing to be able to do in uh, academic labs, in industry, in general. Mixtures are not typically uh, good. We like to know what's in the individual, uh, what the individual components are of that mixture. <coughs> We're going to primarily be using gas chromatography, GC, uh, in this course as a, as a technique, coupled to EI mass spec. I'll define the EI term later, but uh, MS is the abbreviation, again, underscore this for mass spectrometry. We're going to be doing this on the same organic samples that we will be analyzing by NMR spectroscopy. The organic sample that we're analyzing needs to be sufficiently volatile to vaporize. This is a high temperature uh, vacuum technique. And like any chromatography technique, there's a stationary phase and a mobile phase. The stationary phase, all we really need to know is that it's a thin packed column uh, containing a certain type of material. The mobile phase, as you could probably guess from the title of the technique, is a gas. It's a helium, typically ultra-purity, ultra-high-purity helium. And the organic sample is volatilized in the chamber and carried along the column. And each component of the organic uh, mixture has specific retention time. And that's, that's one way we can characterize uh, the components of a mixture if we know something about that mixture already. But typically, it's used as a separation technique. This picture shows a... Uh, Common, I think it's identical to the one we have in the Chem 344 course, um, a combined GCMS instrument. So it's, as you can see, it's a benchtop uh, technique. It's not a particularly expensive technique to do, um, but it's a, a very powerful technique to be familiar with and to be able to employ. And this is the output of a GC trace. This is a, I, I believe this is a real um, GC output. It's from the National Physical Laboratory in England. And it's the uh, GC output of a BTEX mixture, which is benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene isomers. And this, perhaps, is how you would expect it to look. It looks somewhat like a bar chart. And we're seeing that for a specific retention time, which is typically measured in minutes, um, we have, in this mixture, we know that there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six components, the three isomers of xylenes, ethyl benzene, toluene, and benzene. And we can see that on this axis here, we have the output of the detector. It happens to be measured in millivolts. That's not really important. What we can say is the area under each of these uh, signals corresponds to the relative amount of each component in the BTEX mixture. And we can see that benzene has a retention time of 0.7 minutes, toluene, methyl benzene, has a retention time of 1.2 minutes, ethyl benzene 2.3, and so on. But what's driving this separation? Well, what's driving it is the boiling points of these organic compounds. We can see that benzene has the uh, lowest retention time. It, it hits the detector first. It comes off the column the fastest. It has the lowest boiling point, about 80 degrees. Uh, toluene has a boiling point of 111, ethyl benzene 136. And we can see as we get to higher uh, boiling point components, they have a longer residence time on the column. They have a higher retention time. 
<coughs> something we should point out, though, is that we know that there are six components in this mixture. However, we only see one, two, three, four, five signals, which implies that there are only five resolvable components. And we can see that for metaxylene and paraxylene, they are very, very similar boiling points. Uh, probably, I, th I think, there are less than a degree difference in, in their boiling points. So the parameters of this particular uh, gas chromatography experiment weren't sufficient to separate paraxylene from metaxylene. So if we didn't know anything about this mixture, we could, be, um, we could be lulled into thinking that there are only five components in this mixture rather than six. But overall, uh, GC is a very powerful technique in its own right. It's a very useful separation technique. If we know specific things about the mixture, we can see that um, we can potentially characterize the components of the mixture. Well, I want to draw our attention to this statement here, that when we combine the GC experiment, the kind of the separation technique, with a mass uh, spectrometry experiment, combined uh, technique is called GCMS, we can obtain a mass spectrum for each of these compounds as it, what we call, elutes from the, uh, from the stationary phase, from the column. And that's a, combined, that's a very, very, very powerful technique. We now have a great separation technique and a powerful characterization technique. And this is um, something you'll be seeing in, in the course uh, right from the start, from the first experiment, and indeed in the practice problem sets. This is really the extent of the knowledge that we need uh, regarding GC, regarding gas chromatography. And for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to concentrate on mass spectrometry, the principles of mass spectrometry. And I keep saying spectrometry rather than spectroscopy because there is a difference between those two terms. The definition of spectroscopy, as we established in Lecture 1, is the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter, or solid liquid gas, whatever form the sample is in. And we're using uh, electromagnetic radiation of a sp specific energy to get specific information about uh, a compound. Whereas spectrometry, mass spectrometry in this case, doesn't use electromagnetic radiation. So it's not accurate to call it spectroscopy. So th those are two terms that we shouldn't uh, feel good about interchanging. They're two separate uh, pieces of terminology. Mass spectrometry uses very, very high energy electrons to, uh, and this is a, a gas phase technique, and those electrons bombard our organic sample. Now, or it could be an inorganic sample. There are very many uh, types of mass spectrometry. And the one we're going to focus on exclusively in Chem 344 is called EI mass spec, electron impact mass spectrometry. These high energy electron beams, well, this, this beam of high energy electrons, I should say, um, typically about 70 electron volts. In the abstract, that's not a particularly meaningful number. But when we realize that the ionization energy for most organic molecules is substantially lower than that, we can get to a situation, and I, perhaps I should define ionization energy, that's the energy you need to put into a molecule to remove one single electron. We have a kind of cartoon uh, representation here. If our organic molecule, M, is hit with a 70 electron volt electron, that's going to form what we call a molecular ion. You may see this, uh, this thing called a parent ion. Uh, I think those two terms are interchangeable. I prefer molecular ion, but in tech other textbooks and uh, websites, you may see this referred to as the parent ion. That's fine, too. The difference between our neutral starting molecule, M, and the molecular ion, which is represented by M in square brackets with a positive charge and a dot to signify um, the presence of an unpaired electron, is that we've actually removed, the electron, uh, high energy electron has removed one electron from our neutral molecule. This molecular ion, this is a typical representation for a generic molecular ion, is a radical cation. So this, this dot represents the presence of a single unpaired electron, which implies that this is a radical species. And of course, the positive charge uh, symbol implies there's a positive charge on this, this, this species. The first piece of information we can get from a uh, mass spectrum is the mass of the molecule that we're studying. This is a charged species, but it relates to the molecular mass in AMUs, atomic mass units, of our neutral molecule. The only difference in mass between the molecular ion 
and the molecule is the mass of one electron, which is certainly measurable, but very small. Certainly not detectable um, on a benchtop mass spectrometer. So we already get information about the mass of the neutral molecule by looking at the molecular ion, observing the mass of the molecular ion. This molecular ion is incredibly energetic. It's been hit with a very, very uh, high energy electron, and it's unstable. And it's going to do something to uh, kind of release that excess energy. Bond breaking, bond forming, rearrangement uh, processes are going to occur on this molecular, uh, within this molecular ion. And ultimately, that molecular ion will fragment. It will fall apart. The good thing is that it can fragment, and it will fragment, in a predictable way, according to some stability rules and some patterns that we're going to um, talk about and, and explain. So the molecular fragmentation process gives us information on the, the connectivity of the molecule. A very kind of um, low-level analogy is to take an egg and fire a shotgun at the egg. That's going to splatter the egg all over the place. But the beauty of mass spec is that we can take the fragments of that egg and piece, piece it back together to give us the to give us the egg, if you like. So we're really using, uh, destroying the sample, but kind of on paper being able to piece it back together according to the mass of the molecular fragments that we see in the mass spectrum. I've mentioned isotopes here, and that's something we're going to spend maybe five or ten minutes discussing uh, as well. Isotope patterns are very useful in mass spectrometry. So this is the basis of the technique. Formation of a molecular ion, then rapid fragmentation into uh, its constituent pieces, <clears throat> along with some rearrangements, some new bonds being formed, some bonds being broken, etc. This is a mass spectrum. This is the EI mass spectrum, the electron ionization mass spectrum of methanol, a very simple organic molecule. And I think it's worth just taking time to uh, kind of orient ourselves with the form of this mass spectrum. This is how they're all going to appear. Uh, we have uh, an axis, meaning, a meaningful axis along this direction and a meaningful axis along the y direction. What I've got here is a picture of methanol. And we'll agree that its molecular weight is 32 grams per mole. If we added up all the, uh, the hydrogens and the carbon and the oxygen, we would get that value. And we can see that in the mass spectrum, there are, again, it looks somewhat like a bar chart in that there are... Uh, lines corresponding to certain MZ values, and we'll, we'll define that in a second. And those, those lines are of different intensity. Their intensity axis runs from 0 to 100. We can call that relative intensity in percentage. Sometimes this is termed relative abundance, depending on the textbook or the uh, website that you're looking at. But again, they're kind of interchangeable. It's a 0 to 100 scale on the y-axis, and our MZ uh, value can stretch, can be, can be very, very narrow in this case, or it can stretch up to three, four, five hundred um, units. Let's define some things here. We know that the molecular weight of methanol is 32, so we might expect that the mass of the molecular ion would also be 32, because all we've done in forming the molecular ion is remove one single electron from the neutral molecule and form a charged species, a radical cation. And that's indeed what we see we see the molecular ion of methanol, which we don't know anything about the structure yet. We're going to talk about that in a second. But it's certainly detectable. It's about 70% abundant if we read uh, the intensity of this, this line across here. The intensity of this signal gets to about 70%. OK, fair enough. That probably confirms that we've got methanol <coughs> in our sample. Uh, and this is the, the mass spectrum of it. But there are some um, other signals that we might be interested in. We'll talk about those later. There is one that we need to define right now, and that's called the base peak. The base peak, as you can see, is a uh, signal that is more intense than any other uh, signal in this mass spectrum. Its intensity is 100%. Its abundance is 100%. The base peak represents the most abundant fragment that hits the detector in the MS experiment. And the intensity of that line is uh, automatically set to 100% and everything else is measured relative to it. So a new piece of terminology here is the base peak. That may or may not be one mass unit less than the molecular ion. For methanol, it is. 
for the majority of uh, molecules that you see, it won't be one mass unit less. It could be anywhere in the mass spectrum, but it's always going to be, it's always going to represent the most abundant fragment. It's always going to be the most intense peak in the EI mass spectrum. I think it's time to define uh, the units of this axis here. The M over Z is the mass over charge. It's sometimes called the MZ ratio. And that's, uh, that's a good thing to talk about because we've already kind of defined the mass. We've implied that uh, each of the, the, the molecular ion and thus each of the fragments of it have a mass. They must have because they contain atoms. But we've neglected the charge so far. So the MZ ratio is the mass divided by the charge to give us a specific number. Now when we have uh, more than one unit of charge, this becomes an important thing to consider. But in Chem 344 and in the majority of simple organic molecules, the Z value is one. It's a, uh, a singly charged species. It's a monocation, if you like. So we can mentally neglect the Z value because it's, it's essentially saying M divided by one. But we should always report these, uh, the, 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 like the mass of these fragments, if you like, in units of MZ. We say the MZ value of this fragment is 32. The MZ value of this fragment is 15, et cetera, et cetera. That's the terminology we're going to use. Always recognizing that we're dealing with monocations in this course. So I've spoken about um, the loss of, of an electron, the ejection of an electron from, uh, from a molecule to go from a, a neutral molecule that we want to study to a molecular ion that's uh, lost one electron. If we're going to understand uh, the structure of molecules by mass spec, it would be a really good question to ask and ultimately answer, where on the molecule is the electron uh, removed from? From which site? Because that can then uh, help us begin to start uh, fragmenting the molecule in a reasonable manner. So we're going to answer this question right now. And it really depends on the type of uh, the type of orbitals we have in our molecule. So for alkanes, they all contain sigma bonds. Just a, a pretty boring straight chain alkane it contains carbon, hydrogen, and carbon, uh, carbon sigma bonds. And if we subject that to uh, high energy electrons, we're going to remove one electron from each molecule. But we can't really be highly specific, at least initially, about the location in this alkane of electron loss. It could have been lost from, <coughs> excuse me, it could have been lost from this carbon-carbon bond, or this carbon-carbon bond, or this carbon-carbon bond. We can't be absolutely specific. So um, I think a good representation, an accurate and, and sufficient representation of the molecular ion of a, just a regular alkane is something like this. Drawing the molecule in square brackets, and uh, adding a positive charge and a dot to symbolize the unpaired electron. That's as specific as we want to be right now. Um, we're going to walk through the mass spectrum of octane quite shortly to show that we can be perhaps a little bit more specific about this. But in general, this is sufficient representation of the molecular ion of an alkane, if uh, a molecule only containing sigma bonding. When we uh, consider alkenes, or really any molecule containing a pi bond, we now have two different types of bonds. Sigma, of course, we have a sigma framework, and we also have a localized pi bond in this molecule. And we'll realize that pi bonds, pi electrons, uh, are, reside in orbitals that are of higher energy than, uh, than sigma orbitals. So if we subject an alkene to a high energy electron, we can now be quite specific about the site at which the electron is going to be lost. This is the most likely molecular ion. This is the site at which it's most likely that the electron will be removed. And that's going to be from this pi bond here. So we can draw a pair of resonance structures to show the loss of one electron from a pi bond. We can draw a localized radical on this carbon atom and a formal positive charge here, or a localized uh, formal positive charge on this carbon and the unpaired electron on the terminal carbon atom. These are resonance structures. And the resonance hybrid, is it's accurate to show it in this way. Again, with a square bracket, with the positive charge on the outside now, and 
essentially a kind of a half bond between these two carbon atoms. This is a, either of these are <coughs> sufficient representations of um, the most likely molecular ion from an alkene. But we could also have uh, a proportion of our alkene molecular ions where the single electron has been lost from this carbon-carbon bond. And the pi bond remains intact. Statistically, that is possible. But the most likely site of electron loss is going to be from the pi bond because the pi orbitals are higher in energy than the sigma bonds. And then the final most common uh, type of molecule we're going to come across in, in basic organic chemistry contains heteroatoms. And we've, I think I've defined uh, in a previous lecture what a heteroatom is. It's essentially a non-carbon or hydrogen atom. It's oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, silicon, anything really like that. And the heteroatom compounds I've listed on here all, can, all uh, feature lone pairs, one or more lone pairs of electrons. Those lone pairs are in orbitals that are of even higher energy than a sigma frame, uh, the, uh, sorry, the pi orbitals, which in turn are of higher energy than the sigma orbitals. So if we subject this, this ketone to high energy electrons, 70 electron volt uh, electron beam, we can be confident that the most likely site of electron loss is going to be from one of the lone pairs on the oxygen atom. So we can draw a very specific molecular ion. It doesn't matter for our purposes which one of these electrons is removed. We want to be very accurate about the way we draw this molecular ion. And localizing our formal positive charge on this oxygen atom and showing one intact lone pair and one half lone pair, if you like. We've lost a single electron from one of the lone pairs of the oxygen. This is the most likely molecular ion for this ketone. But we could also consider a situation where we've lost a single electron from perhaps this carbon-carbon bond or this carbon-carbon bond. There would be a molecular ion that looks like that. There would also be perhaps a molecular ion that has uh, resulted from loss of an electron from this carbon-oxygen bond with the two lone pairs remaining intact. That's possible as well. All molecular ions can form. It's just that this one is most, the most likely molecular ion. And we can work back if we're, when we start talking about fragmentation patterns of molecules such as this, it's a good idea to start with the most likely molecular ion and uh, go through our fragmentation routine based upon the structure of that species. That explains the fragmentation pattern, um, typically in a much uh, easier manner. So the takeaway here is that when we're considering the generation of the molecular ion, uh, the single electron is most likely to be removed from the orbital of highest energy. And we'll remember that lone pairs are in higher energy orbitals than uh, pi electrons, which are in higher energy orbitals than uh, sigma electrons. So we formed our molecular ion. I remind you that our molecular ion, this is a, another generic molecular ion. It's a little bit more complex than our uh, M cation that we've seen so far. But I want to remind you that it's a radical cation. It features a single lone pair, uh, a single unpaired electron, and it's also positively charged. And we're going to consider some uh, generic ways in which this radical cation, this molecular ion, can fragment, can essentially fall apart to give us the pieces which we can mentally put back together. So one way in which it can fragment is to form an A cation and a BC radical. Essentially, the single electron, we're, we're, we're implying that there's a single electron between A and B. That single electron has moved onto uh, BC. So that would give us a cation and a radical. And similarly, we could uh, do the opposite fragmentation. We could generate a BC cation and an A-type radical. So that's four, potentially four fragments, at least, from just this generic ABC uh, molecular ion. So that might appear initially to be quite a lot to keep track of. Just a, a simple species results in at least four fragments and possibly more. Well, there's something we really need to remember. This is a, a really important point in this lecture. We're establishing where, how we can simplify our understanding of fragmentation processes. <coughs> We've already seen that the radical cation can be detected. 
we've seen the radical cation detected of, of uh, methanol. These two cations, the A-type cation and the BC-type cation, will also be detected. Whatever their MZ value is, it will be detected. And we know that we've seen the radical cation. So these green check marks show us what we can expect to detect in the EI mass spectrum of this generic molecule. What will not be detected are radicals. Radicals, even though they contain uh, an unpaired electron, are neutral compounds. They contain no charge. They, they're chargeless. And the rule is that EI mass spec detects only charged species. Only cations are radical cations, not radicals. So we can forget about seeing the evidence, or, or, or the presence, if you like, of radical A or radical BC. That won't appear as a signal in our mass spectrum. Signals from the A cation and the BC cation and the ABC radical cation will, however. Another way in which this uh, molecular ion could fragment is to form, if you like, a daughter radical cation, an AB radical cation, and a, a neutral molecule which doesn't contain an unpaired electron. A regular molecule, if you like, a closed shell molecule, as opposed to an open shell molecule which contains an odd number of electrons. We've already established that radical cations will be detected. So we would expect to, again, detect the ABC radical cation and the AB daughter radical cation. We wouldn't expect to detect the neutral molecule. These are the two big takeaways here. Only cations and radical cations are detected in the EI mass spec experiment. Only signals from cat cations and radical cations will appear in our mass spectrum. Radicals which are not charged, and other neutral molecules, real molecules, if you like, such as carbon monoxide, water, alkenes, uh, can be ejected, but they're not detected by the EI mass spec. We can infer that carbon monoxide, for instance, has been um, extruded from a fragment, but we're not going to see a signal from carbon monoxide in EI mass spec. It's really important that we uh, are clear on that, uh, that difference. Okay, so let's start now talking about some real mass spectra of real molecules. I have an alkene, uh, sorry, an alkane on the screen here, octane. This is its EI mass spectrum. <coughs> Formula C8H18. And the molecular weight of a sample of octane, it's, uh, the molecule has a molecular weight of 114 grams per mole. That's perfectly fine. When we subject this uh, molecule to the conditions of EI mass spec, the first thing we might want to look for in the output mass spectrum is the molecular ion. We would expect to see um, a signal with a mass charge ratio of 114, because this will be a radical cation. One of the, an electron will be lost from this carbon-carbon bond, or this one, or this one. Somewhere on that molecule, an electron has been lost. The, its charge is 1, so we should expect to see a molecular ion at 114. And indeed, we do. It's not particularly Abundant, it's about probably less than 10%, but it's formed and it's uh, sufficiently long-lived that it hits the detector. There is some travel time between the formation of an ion or a, a fragment and when it hits the detector. And some things can happen in that kind of that, that dwell time. But for now, we should understand that this molecular ion forms and fragments quite quickly, but some of it is still long, sufficiently long-lived that it can hit the detector. And then the fragments that I've labeled here, 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 and here are the ones that we're interested in. You'll notice that there are lots of other fragments as well of relatively higher or lower intensity. This one, for instance, might be interesting. This one might be this one. But we don't have to go hunting for every single, or for the identity of every single fragment in a mass spectrum because this is a high uh, vacuum, high energy technique, and a lot of really odd molecular rearrangements and fragmentations, and a lot of odd chemistry happens in a high-energy vacuum. So we re don't really need to consider, the, if you like, the fingerprint of the mass spectrum of this molecule. Um, when you get a mass spectrum, we'll always be directed to the particular fragments that we want you to uh, either assign the structure for or predict the structure of, and they'll be labeled. So in this case, we're interested in the structure of this fragment, and this fragment, this one, this one, this one, and we know the structure of this fragment. It looks exactly like this, except we don't know 
where we've lost the from where we've lost the electron on the molecule. And this signal right here, MZ43, is our base peak. That's as a reminder. That's the most intense uh, signal in the mass spectrum. That implies that that's the uh, the most abundant molecular fragment that's uh, being detected. So let's be a little specific here. Let's now start thinking about various points along the octane molecule at, where, uh, at which points a single electron can be lost from a sigma bond, a two-center, two-electron bond. So just for reference, I'll always have the, uh, the structure and the name and the molecular weight of the molecule up here, octane, of course, in this example. And if we imagine that we've lost a single electron from this carbon-carbon bond here, the carbon-carbon bond between the methylene group and the terminal methyl group, this bond here, which relates to this bond right here, we can draw, if you like, a two-center, one-electron bond. There's one electron removed from this molecule, which is signified by this. This is the remaining electron. But we're being perhaps a little more specific and saying that single electron is located between this carbon atom and this carbon atom. Well, there's two ways in which this particular molecular ion can fragment to give us two charged fragments. One way would be if the single electron that's located in this kind of carbon-carbon bond axis ultimately locates itself on this carbon atom. That will mean that we've lost a CH3, a methyl, cation, which we would expect to detect if this is indeed formed. That would have a mass charge ratio of 15, which we would see because it's a charged species, it's a cation, and we would expect to see uh, a signal in the mass spectrum of mz equals 15. And we can infer that a radical of mass 99 has also been found, but we would not detect that. And if we mentally do the opposite uh, uh, kind of uh, gymnastics of that single unpaired of that single electron in the carbon-carbon bond, <coughs> we can infer uh, a methyl radical a mass of 15, and a long chain, uh, what would this be, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, heptile cation of mass charge 99. Okay, so this, this makes some sense. Uh, if we were drawing this, we would use uh, single-headed arrows because we're using, uh, we're, we're considering the movement of a single electron rather than double-headed arrows when we consider the movement of pairs of electrons. Um, and we'll, we'll show some of those fragmentation diagrams later. But the interesting thing, and the thing we should be aware of, is that neither is the methyl cation nor the heptyl cation detected in our mass spectrum. We don't see a signal corresponding to a mass charge ratio of 15 or corresponding to a mass charge ratio of 99. It's not present in our mass spectrum, in our ex experimental mass spectrum. Both of these fragmentation pathways, this one, or this one involved the formation of a methyl species, either a methyl cation or a methyl radical. That's quite disfavored. If we remember from Chem 343 that the, the stability order of either a cation or a radical goes tertiary cations or radicals are more stable than secondary radicals or cations more stable than primary, which are much more stable than methyl. So methyl fragment, whether it's cation or radical, is disfavored energetically. It's at the bottom of this stability series. That doesn't mean that we'll never ever see a, a methyl cation. It means that its formation is disfavored energetically. It doesn't mean that it's forbidden. So let's, let's talk about now what we, perhaps what we do see in the uh, mass spectrum of octane. Let's now move over one carbon-carbon bond and assume that the site of electron loss was between these two carbon atoms here. Let me orient here. These two carbon atoms. This carbon atom and this carbon atom has now had one electron removed from its formerly two-center, two-electron bond. And we can, again, draw this kind of uh, two-center, one-electron bond right here. And if we mentally do the fragmentation pattern, if we draw our uh, single-headed arrows, our fish hook arrows, we can come up again with two potential fragments that will form. We can form this uh, now primary carbocation with a mass charge ratio of 85. And the, Im the implication is that we've lost an ethyl radical, which we would not detect because it's uh, neutral, it's uncharged. And if we do the 
kind of the opposite fragmentation pattern, we would detect an ethyl cation with a mass charge ratio of 29, and uh, the presence of a long chain primary radical is implied. Well, we do actually see a signal with a, uh, corresponding to a fragment with an MZ value of 85, and we do see this fragment formed in the mass spectrum as well with an MZ value of 29. So what's real, the real difference is that we've gone from forming methyl species to forming primary carbocations and primary radicals. And this kind of combined stability is important. The stability of the cation and the radical is an important consideration when we're deciding what kind of fragmentation uh, can occur from a molecular ion, or even from a fragment. And we'll, we'll, we'll show that in a second. So now we're moving further along octane, and we're looking at the situation where we've lost uh, an electron from this carbon-carbon bond here, the kind of the central carbon uh, bonded to this methylene unit here. We're imagining that this is now a two-center, one-electron bond. There's one electron holding this uh, transient species together, and it can, you know, put simply, either move to the left or to the right, and it can produce this particular Again, primary carbocation, one, two, three, four, that's a uh, pentyl carbocation, or this propyl carbocation. Correspondingly, we can get these two radicals as well, which we, uh, as a reminder, will not detect. So we do see this fragment and this fragment as well. They are experimentally detected in the mass spectrum, EI mass spectrum of octane. But there's another way in which we can form this propyl cation. It can form by fragmentation of the molecular ion, absolutely, but it can also form by fragmentation of a fragment. In this example, we're going to consider the fragmentation of this species here. So this fragment has been formed by uh, degradation of the molecular ion, and this fragment itself will fall apart. It will fragment in a, in a logical way. So this carbon-carbon bond now in the 1, 2, 3, 4, propyl um, cation is undergoing a two electron, let me backtrack, the two electrons of this carbon-carbon bond are uh, forming a new pi bond. So this fragment is fragmenting by loss of two electrons from the carbon-carbon bond to give a propyl cation, which we can detect, which is just the same, it's exactly the same as this one, mass charge ratio 43, mass charge ratio 43. And the byproduct is ethene. It's an alkene, it's a neutral molecule, it's a real molecule, if you like. That won't be detected. So it's important to, this, this slide uh, really shows that not all fragments are formed by degradation of the molecular ion. Some fragments can be formed by fragmentation of fragments of the molecular ion. So you can see how this gets quite complex quite quickly. Even for a relatively simple molecule such as octane, there are uh, quite a few principles that we've got to keep straight here. But they're all grounded in chemistry, of course. There's nothing particularly special about, uh, about this example, except that we've just got to keep track of the fact that we can form fragments in various ways. And finally, just to round this off, uh, we can see that there's a, a way in which we can form um, a cation that has a mass charge ratio of 57, which again is experimentally detected. So the takeaway is that the aggregate stability, the combined stability of the cation and the radical uh, which is formed from it, is, is an important consideration in determining uh, which kind of fragmentation pattern is going to happen. Fragmentations involving the formation of a methyl cation or a methyl radical are disfavored energetically, but I want to underscore that that does not mean that they won't ever happen, that they're forbidden. They certainly can happen. They're just, they tend to be uh, disfavored. But we'll see an example later on, I think, where we actually do detect uh, a methyl cation. So let's move to, oh, okay, I just want to round off our mass spectrum of octane here. We'll see that, again, our molecular ion is here, the base peak is here, and we rationalize the formation of all of these uh, these, these kind of uh, fragments of the molecular ion. And we also rationalize the fact that we didn't see a uh, 
fragment with a mass charge ratio of 99, which would correspond to the formation of a methyl radical. If we look very, very, very closely, we can perhaps argue that there is some methyl cation formed right there. That's probably less than 1% abundant. But experimentally, we can see the formation of a methyl cation. It's just a very, very, very low uh, abundance fragment. So what we're doing here is going from the methyl, <laughs> methyl, I'm sorry, the molecular ion, and we've lost 29 mass units, which corresponds to an ethyl radical, CH3, CH2, to form this cation. And then the difference between this cation and this cation is 14. This one and this one is 14. 57 minus 43, it's 14. 43 minus 29, 14. So this is a regular pattern that's happening. And just for fun, I included loss of uh, 14 mass units from the ethyl radical, I'm sorry, the ethyl cation to form the methyl cation, as I said. Experimentally detectable, but very, very low um, abundance. And the final thing to remember is that there are two ways to form this particular, uh, we focused on the, the propyl cation, there are two ways to form it. It can form directly from the molecular ion, or it can also form by fragmentation of fragments that are formed from the molecular ion. And that's really true for 71 and 57 as well. But it's not true for 29 and 50. So this might, this might explain why our base peak is the propyl cation, or rather why the propyl cation is the base peak. I think that's a better way of putting it, uh, because this has at least two ways in which it can form. Everything kind of funnels down to the propyl cation, hence there's relatively more of it uh, hitting the detector. So this is the mass spectrum, a simple straight chain uh, alkane. Let's move to a slightly more complex situation where we have now a branched chain alkane. This is two methyl pentane. Its molecular weight is 86 grams per mole. We would expect to see a molecular ion with a mass charge ratio of 86. Indeed, we do. The base peak, again, is the, probably the propyl cation. We can maybe make that statement now because we can see, if we look at the molecule, we can perhaps see how a propyl cation can be formed. And we know from the previous slide that a propyl cation has a mass charge ratio of 43. We also know that an ethyl cation has a mass charge value of 29. And we're seeing uh, about 10% abundance of the ethyl cation there. And we can see how that might be formed here. We have a ethyl unit here, CH3, CH2. And also, if we uh, flip back to the slide, we, uh, previous slide, we can see that this number is familiar to us as well. Let's see the potential fragmentation pathways of 2-methylpentane, this branched chain alkane. Well, of course, we see that molecular ion. It's, again, not particularly abundant. It's probably less than 10% abundant. I think that is less than 10%, yeah. But it's formed, it fragments quickly, but it's sufficiently long-lived that it can hit the detector. So I've, I've color-coded uh, the two methyl groups here. So this is the bond that we're thinking about fragmenting here. So the, if, we, if we mentally replace this with um, a, an electron holding these two carbon atoms together, the unpaired electron has located itself on, the methyl, on this methyl group, the red methyl group, and formed a methyl cation, I'm sorry, a methyl radical, and the corresponding one, two, three, four, five uh, pentyl cation is formed. Notice, though, that this is now a secondary carbocation rather than a primary carbocation. And we know that secondary carbocations are more stable than primary carbocations. So this is a uh, different electronic structure, pentyl cation, but it still has the same mass charge ratio. It still has the same uh, constituent atoms. Uh, another way in which we can uh, fragment uh, 2-methylpentane molecular ion is right here. We can break we can break this bond here, this carbon, carbon bond, and assume that the, uh, the single unpaired electron has located itself on this carbon and carried away, uh, and, and with it, we form a isopropyl cation, again, a secondary carbocation, which is more stable than a primary carbocation. 
So in the aggregate, we formed a secondary carbocation and a primary radical, or we've also formed a secondary carbocation and a methyl radical. We detect both of these species. So an important point to note is that when we have a branched chain alkane, that's a site of uh, stability for any fragments that will form from that molecular ion. We can potentially go up to a tertiary carbocation if we have a branch chain alkane. And one point to note is that this carbocation forms readily and is, is, is persistent. It's a secondary carbocation and a relatively large amount of it is detected. A relatively large amount of the species hits the detector. We can't really say anything about really the stability of this, um, or rather how much is formed, I should say. We can only talk about the stability of this species because it may well form readily, but it apparently fragments more rapidly. It can fragment to a, uh, a propyl cation. So this forms, but fragments quite quickly, whereas the, uh, this species forms and is sufficiently persistent. Either it forms directly or is formed by uh, fragmentation of a of this fragment as well. So again, there's quite a lot going on in the, uh, when we're thinking about the mass spectrum of, again, a relatively simple molecule such as a branch chain uh, alkane. And I want to rest there. Um, oh, okay, let's, 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 let's tie this up before I move on to the next subject. We know what the structure of our molecular ion is going to be. It's going to uh, probably have an electron loss from one of this, these branch points here. And these are the structures of the fragments that we, the important fragments that we can detect. A secondary carbocation here, a secondary carbocation here, and a um, ethyl radical, a ethyl cation at mass charge 29. So I'm going to talk about now about um, isotopes. Because isotopes are a, a nice thing to have when we're looking at mass spec, they're very useful um, kind of detection tool. They, they can simplify our, our understanding sometimes of, uh, of certain molecules. This is a review. Iso atoms exist as different isotopes. There's a different number of neutrons but the same number of protons. So it's only really in the, in the nucleus where any major change uh, has happened, but we're familiar with a whole bunch of isotopes. So we've even discussed uh, an isotope in, in some depth in the uh, NMR spectroscopy lectures. We're using uh, deuterium to our advantage in NMR. But uh, we can also use carbon-13 NMR, and uh, Dr. Esselman will give a brief lecture on the uses of carbon-13 NMR uh, after this one. I think that's lecture four. Um, and we can see that about 1%, slightly over 1% of any carbon atom containing sample has, uh, is the carbon-13 isotope. The implication is that the vast majority of, of the rest of it is the carbon-12 isotope. I, I don't know the relative abundance of carbon-14, but it's quite low. Um, so in any sample of carbon, about 1% of the uh, atoms are the carbon-13 isotope. Similar, similarly, much less uh, of any sample of hydrogen is deuterium, and a little over a third of a sample of nitrogen is nitrogen-15. These are the less common isotopes, but they can certainly be useful. But when we think about certain atoms, bromine and chlorine, for instance, we'll see that they have um, kind of non-unity numbers on the periodic table, atomic masses on the periodic table. But the mass of bromine on the periodic table is 79.9. And, and more puzzlingly, when I was uh, just starting to learn chemistry, the, uh, the mass of chlorine was 35 35 and a half, 35.48. And I knew that electrons and protons were important in the, in, in the mass of these, um, these atoms. And this always implied to me the presence of half an electron, which, which, which didn't really make sense until I learned about isotopes. And learned a lot of other stuff as well, but isotopes can explain why we have, uh, not only for chlorine and bromine, but for other atoms, these, these odd uh, molecular ma atomic masses. So in any sample of bromine, 50.7% of those atoms are the 79 bromine isotope, and 49.3% approximately percent, uh, of those bromine atoms are the 81 bromine isotope. 
So there's an approximately one-to-one -one ratio of 79 and 81 bromine isotopes. This can be useful in, in mass spec, and we'll see how in a second. For chlorine, its uh, atomic mass is 35.48. That's comprised of approximately 75% of the chlorine 35 isotope and approximately 25%, near 24% of the chlorine 37 isotope. These are in an approximate 3 to 1 ratio. And again, this reveals itself in the mass spectrum because we're looking at individual uh, molecules, not, the, not averages. Let's take a look at one bromobutane here. This is a, again, a, a simple, not particularly exciting molecule, uh, except we've now got a, a functional uh, group in there, we've got some functionality. We could do some chemistry on this molecule. And let's just ignore this area for now. We'll explain this in a second. I probably should have animated this. But if we were to, um, in the lab, for instance, work out how much 1-bromobutane we might need uh, to do a reaction, we would look up its molecular weight and say the molecular weight of 1-bromobutane routed up is 137 grams per mole. And that would be accurate. So we might expect to see in the mass spectrum of 1-bromobutane a molecular ion with a mass charge value of 137. But as I've revealed here, we don't see that. We see two molecular ions. Recall that these are the uh, relative ratios of 79 and, bromine, 79 and 81 bromine isotopes. So the molecular uh, weight, if you like, of the molecular ion, that's an inaccurate term, but the mass spectrometer doesn't see this value. It sees two molecular ions in an approximate one-to-one -one ratio. One of those molecular ions has a mass charge value of 138, and the other molecular ion has a mass charge ratio of 136. That's the molecular ion, and we're going to go ahead and say that the most likely molecular ion results from loss of a, uh, an electron from one of the lone pairs of bromine. So this is a, a good, accurate representation of the most likely molecular ion of 1-bromobutane for the bromine 81 isotope and the bromine 79 isotope. And the intensity of these two molecular ions is approximately 1 to 1. And so it goes. We can say that this fragment here, it has a, a, a relatively complex structure. It's not immediately obvious, or it won't be immediately obvious to us how that's formed. But what we can say is that looking at its form, we can say that whatever this fragment is contains bromine. Because we're seeing that signature isotope pattern. This one-to-one -one isotope pattern, this fragment contains the 81 bromine isotope, this fragment contains the 79 bromine isotope. <coughs> and if we look really carefully, we can see that at this point here, we have a very, very small fragment, or rather low abundance fragment, mass charge of 79, and this one right here, mass charge 81. That is the bromine radical cation. That's detectable. Certainly less than 1% abundant, but experimentally detected. And this is not a particularly sophisticated um, mass spectrometer that was used to obtain these data. So these, this example of an isotope pattern is very useful as we're piecing together uh, not only the molecular, molecular ion, but the fragments of the molecular ion as well. For instance, here, I, can, I don't necessarily know what the structure of this fragment is, but I know it contains bromine because it contains that signature uh, kind of one-to-one -one pattern of the two isotopes. And we might be comfortable now saying that, well, if we look at our molecule, we can see that this uh, fragment here has a mass charge value of 29. That's likely to be an ethyl cation because we can see how an ethyl cation might be formed in this molecule. Similarly for the uh, fragment with mass charge ratio of 57, we can see how that has been formed. It's actually been formed by fragmentation of this molecular ion and this molecular ion, each of which are losing their bromine atom, they both result in this primary carbocation. So I've kind of done the math for you here. This molecular ion has lost its bromine atom to give this carbocation, and this molecular ion has lost its bromine atom to give the same carbocation. That's the base peak. Let's take another example here. Let's change the halogen to chlorine. Benzyl chloride is a benzene ring with a CH2 chlorine group on it. That's the benzyl group. 
a benzene ring with a methylene uh, group attached to it, and then something else attached to that methylene. And again, if we were to uh, calculate the molecular weight of benzyl chloride, if we were measuring out you know, uh, a couple of mils of benzyl chloride, we would calculate it to be 126, approximately 126.5 grams per mole, and that would be okay. We might expect to see a molecular ion of mass charge ratio 126.5, but we know that's not true anymore because we now know that this doesn't make any sense in terms of whole numbers. We're only ever seeing whole numbers in our mass spectrum. So this must be due to the presence of two isotopes of chlorine. Again, I remind you that the chlorine 35 and 37 isotopes are in an approximate 3 to 1 ratio. So what the our mass spec experiment sees is this molecular ion and this molecular ion, two distinct molecular ions. The only difference between them is one contains a chlorine 35 isotope, which is three times more abundant than the, uh, the isotopomer containing the chlorine 37 isotope. These are in approximate 3 to 1 ratio, right here. Mass 128 and 126 uh, atomic mass units. And then this species fragments. And if we do the math, we can see that if we lose from the 128 mz molecular ion, from this molecular ion right here, if, we, <coughs> if the chlorine atom uh, is ejected, we're going to lose 37 mass units and come up with a fragment that has a mass charge ratio of 91. Similarly, if we do the same thing for this molecular ion, the chlorine-35 molecular ion, we're going to come up with exactly the same uh, fragment. What I can tell you, even if I didn't know the structure of this fragment, mass charge 91, I do know that it doesn't contain chlorine. I know that that has been found by loss of chlorine because this fragment doesn't feature this specific chlorine isotope pattern. This does not contain a chlorine isotope pattern. That means chlorine is not present in this base peak fragment. We can say that unequivocally. And this is actually quite an interesting uh, fragment in its own right. So this uh, 91 uh, fragment, the base peak, is an interesting structure. This is the, this is the benzyl cation. And this is uh, what's called the tropillium carbocation. And this is the result of the rearrangement of this benzyl cation. Both of these are aromatic species. That's got an aromatic ring. This is uh, a much a substantially more stable aromatic species by about, I think it's over five or six uh, kilocalories per mole, which is it's quite a substantial uh, energy difference. <clears throat> what we can't say, and what I, what I don't know with any certainty, is kind of the relative proportions of uh, these two species contributing to this base peak fragment. It's certainly going to be a mixture of tropillium carbocation and uh, benzyl carbocation, but uh, I, I don't know the, the, the relative amounts with any great certainty, except to say that with this being uh, much more stable, substantially more stable than this, it's a good uh, bet that this is uh, the majority of the signal. So this compound comprises the majority of the fragments of mass charge ratio 91, but there still may be you know, between 5 and 15% um, of the fragments hitting the detector with mass charge ratio 91 that are this, this benzyl cation, because that must form first before this can be formed. But it's good to know that uh, this is something they're actually going to explore in the WebMO uh, exercises uh, when we work through chapter 5 in the, uh, in the computer lab. But the takeaway here, I, I certainly don't want to get off track, is we're talking about isotopes of, uh, in this case, bromine and chlorine, and these signature isotope patterns uh, are very helpful in determining whether a particular fragment contains, in the previous slide, bromine, or in this case, doesn't contain chlorine. So these uh, molecular ions contain chlorine-37 and chlorine-35. This fragment does not contain chlorine, regardless of what we know about its structure, we know it doesn't contain chlorine because it doesn't display that signature 3 to 1 uh, chlorine isotope pattern. Chlorine and bromine are probably the only um, heteroatoms that we're going to consider in depth in 344 that have signature isotope patterns. So if you're confident looking at uh, chlorine and, and bromine isotope patterns, that should uh, cover most of the, uh, this, this kind of material.
So let's go back now to the mass spectrum of methanol. I used this example uh, to kind of set the scene for explaining molecular ions and base peaks and just really getting us used to looking at uh, simple mass spectra. But now we can actually use uh, some of the information we've got to understand, firstly, the structure of the molecular ion of methanol and then ultimately how that molecular ion um, fragments to form certain uh, fragments that we're going to discuss right now. So <clears throat> we have methanol. We've already established that its molecular weight is 32. Uh, there are no significant isotopes in this molecule, so we can be certain that the molecular ion that forms will appear at uh, 32. We're not looking for any isotope pattern in this molecule. We can be specific about the location of the uh, electron loss in the most common molecular ion, the most likely molecular ion now. Methanol contains uh, a sigma framework, so there are carbon-hydrogen, carbon-oxygen, uh, sigma bonds. There are also uh, lone pairs, two of which, uh, on the oxygen. And we know that lone pair orbitals are a higher energy than uh, sigma orbitals. So it's, I think, logical to expect that the most likely molecular ion will result from loss of an electron from one of the lone pairs on oxygen. And we can draw it in this way. Our molecular ion, the most likely molecular ion, is going to look like this. The oxygen is going to have a lone pair, uh, the radical will be located on it, and a formal positive charge. This is our radical cation molecular ion, the mass charge ratio of 32. There's a number of ways in, this, in which this fragment, uh, rather this molecular ion, can fragment, can degrade. One way is by cleavage of this carbon-oxygen bond. This is a two-center, two-electron bond. <coughs> this this uh, bond can cleave. Both electrons can uh, move on to the oxygen atom, forming a hydroxyl radical and a methyl carbocation. And that is a relatively abundant species. It uh, looks like it's over 10% abundant. So this is a sufficiently um, kind of happening uh, fragmentation such that a significant amount of uh, the methyl cation is detected. So as a reminder, we're using double-headed arrows here because we're implying the, uh, the movement of two electrons, an electron pair from this carbon-oxygen bond, resulting in a methyl carbocation and a hydroxyl radical. We, will, we do detect this. We won't detect this species because it's, even though it's open shell, it's a neutral, it's a neutral molecule. So that's one way in which we can fragment the molecular ion of methanol to form a methyl cation. That's right here. And we've accounted for this fragment now. Another way is by now you're thinking about uh, movement of single electrons. So the same molecular ion can fragment in a different way. The single electron that's located on oxygen, and one of the electrons from this carbon-hydrogen bond, remember this is a two-center, two-electron bond, one of the electrons from this carbon-hydrogen bond can locate themselves in this carbon-oxygen bond axis, and ultimately that's going to form a new carbon-oxygen bond. So we now have a formal carbon-oxygen double bond. The other electron from this previously two center, two electron carbon hydrogen bond will locate onto the hydrogen to form a hydrogen radical, which we won't detect. So in going from the molecular ion and losing a hydrogen radical, we've lost one mass unit. So this accounts for the nature of the base peak. The base peak has this structure called an oxonium, an oxonium cation. It's also protonated formaldehyde. If we take off this hydrogen atom and replace that positive with a positive charge with a lone pair, we have the formaldehyde molecules. This is essentially, uh, if you want to think about it that way, protonated formaldehyde. And notice that the oxygen has a formal positive charge now because it's lost uh, one of its lone pairs entirely. One electron of one of those lone pairs was lost in the initial formation of the molecular ion, and the other lone pair electron was lost in forming the new carbon-oxygen uh, double bond. So this is the structure of our base peak ion. 
mass charge value 31. <coughs> now, this species can also fragment as well. We can uh, think about cleaving this oxygen hydrogen bond here in a homolytic manner. So, both electrons uh, from this oxygen hydrogen bond go in different directions. One of the electrons locates on the hydrogen atom, one of them locates itself on the oxygen atom. We lose a hydride uh, radical, which we won't detect, but we will detect this species, this formaldehyde radical cation. So we've got an oxygen atom with a formal lone pair, a formal positive charge, and a single unpaired electron. This will be detected because it's positively charged. That accounts for this signal here of quite low abundance. Like much less than 10% abundant, much less uh, abundant than the metal carbocation. This formaldehyde, this, this radical cation, can itself fragment, lose another hydride, uh, hydrogen radical to give us protonated carbon monoxide. The oxygen features the uh, formal positive charge, and now there's a triple bond between the carbon and the oxygen atom. This accounts for this relatively abundant fragment uh, at MZ29, about 40% abundant. So this is a um, relatively uh, common fragmentation pattern. And probably also tells us why this fragment, this formaldehyde radical cation, is of low abundance. Because as soon as it's formed, it's fragmenting again. And finally, we can account for the signal at MZ28, which is the carbon monoxide radical cation. We've lost, again, one mass unit, which can only be removal of uh, hydrogen radical, to give us this, uh, this species right here, which, again, will be detected because it's a radical cation. So just by thinking about uh, some simple concepts of shuttling electrons around a structure, either double, uh, using double-headed arrows to represent um, pairs of electrons or single-headed arrows to represent the movement of single electrons uh, around a molecule, we can account for the majority of the interesting fragments in the mass spectrum of methanol. We didn't account for, if, if we're really honest, we can see there's something here, something here, 14, 13, 12, that is probably the degradation of the metal cation to give a CH2, which would have a mass charge ratio of 14, a CH, mass charge ratio of 13, and ultimately a carbon uh, cation, a carbon cation with a mass charge ratio of 12, which is barely detectable. So even for a simple molecule, we, we can keep... Um, Kind of, we, we keep some things straight. It looks relatively complex, this, this fragmentation pattern. But once you start doing this yourself as practice, you find that it, it, it's fairly logical. Um, certainly when we're losing only uh, one mass unit, a hydrogen radical, or a radical that kind of makes sense to us, maybe a methyl radical or an ethyl radical. Let's move. This is our final example. This is the mass spectrum of 2 octanol. So this is a long chain ketone. Its molecular weight is 128. There are no significant isotopes that we need to be concerned about. So we would expect to see a molecular ion with a mass charge ratio of 128. And indeed, we do. Not particularly abundant, just less than 10%. So that's forming and uh, decomposing quite rapidly, but it's sufficiently long-lived that um, some of it hits the detector, and we see, its, uh, we see its presence in the mass spectrum. And we know now, we, we have a, a clue about... Uh, the structure of the most likely molecular ion, because again, we know that we have a heteroatom. This heteroatom is oxygen. Oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons. Lone pair orbitals are higher energy than uh, pi orbitals, which are higher energy than sigma orbitals. This molecule has all three. It has sigma bonds, it has pi bonds, and it has lone pair electrons on the oxygen. And if we just stare at this a little more, now some... Uh, some numbers might be quite familiar to us. 15, 29, they can be methyl and ethyl cations, and it's reasonable to see how they could be formed. Could be formed, there's a methyl unit here. There's also a methyl unit here. 
which we need to consider. We can see this ethyl unit, this propyl unit as well, mass charge 43. We're going to talk about the structure of this fragment. We're going to talk about the structure of this fragment as well, because this is the base peak fragment. And 71 is a familiar number to us as well. So I certainly don't want us to start memorizing numbers. Memorization is disastrous in organic chemistry. But a certain amount of pattern recognition in spectroscopy is OK to start with. It's useful when we're beginning uh, to look at NMR spectra. And it's also useful to think about masses of uh, simple fragments, methyl, ethyl, propyl, things of this nature, certainly in uh, relatively simple molecules like this. But sometimes we can have different combinations of elements that give us the same um, mass charge ratio of something that is familiar to us. For instance, the propyl radical, or the, uh, the propyl cation rather, can be formed not only by a, um, a let, me, let me start over on this explanation here. We can have multiple fragments that have mass charge ratio 43 that aren't necessarily hydrocarbon units. And there's an example of this in this molecule right here. So let's think about the structure of 2 octanol. Of, uh, yeah, 2 octanol. This is uh, a ketone right here, 2 octanol. <coughs> Ketones, this is a carbonyl uh, unit right here. And what it's useful for us to be able to do is label the carbon atoms bonded directly to the carbonyl carbon. So this is the carbonyl carbon atom right here. And we can label the carbon atoms linked to it with these numerals here. So this carbon atom is called the alpha carbon. It's bonded directly to the carbonyl carbon. There are two alpha carbons. This one, which is bonded directly to the carbonyl carbon, and this one, which is bonded directly to the carbonyl carbon. And as we go further away from the carbonyl carbon, we get uh, further along our I think this is Greek alphabet. So this is the alpha carbon, this is the beta carbon, this is the gamma carbon, this would be the delta carbon, and so it goes. So this is good to uh, remember, not only for mass spec, but for also understanding some, uh, some carbonyl chemistry as well. Alpha carbons, beta carbons are a terminology we need to get used to. And I'm sure we'll agree that uh, the most common molecular ion, or rather the most likely molecular ion, is going to look like this now. Sure, we can form a molecular ion that has lost its single electron from this carbon-carbon bond, or this carbon-carbon bond, or this carbon-oxygen double bond. But the most likely molecular ion is going to look like this. And we can use the structure of this molecular ion to rationalize the fragmentation pattern of the molecular ion and thus um, understand the structure of the fragments. So if we think about using some single-headed arrows to represent the movement of single electrons, what we have here is this single electron located on the oxygen and one of the electrons from this carbon-carbon bond pairing up. They're going to form a new carbon-oxygen bond to give overall a new uh, carbon-oxygen triple bond. And the remaining electron that we need to account for in this formerly two center two electron carbon-carbon bond locates itself on this particular carbon atom here. This process is called alpha cleavage because we're cleaving or breaking this bond between the carbonyl carbon and the alpha carbon. This alpha cleavage gives us a radical, a long chain a radical, which we're not going to detect. And it gives us this species called the acylium cation. This is a very, very important species, not only in mass spec of ketones, but in um, chemistry of benzene rings, of aromatic uh, substitution chemistry. You're going to see a lot of this species in Chem 345, if you're still taking it, and we're going to talk about this species in depth later on in Chem 344. Suffice to say that the mass charge ratio of the acylium cation is 43, which is also the mass charge value of a propyl cation. So this really explains how just using numbers to understand structures of fragments isn't always the best deal, because this would, we wouldn't have predicted this, um, the nature of this fragment if we were only considering the numbers and only considering the hydrocarbon uh, units. And there are two ways in which this species can undergo alpha cleavage. We've shown one of them, fracture of this carbon-carbon bond. But we have two alpha carbons. This is an alpha carbon as well. And that bond can also break. This bond between the carbonyl carbon and the alpha carbon can break in a similar manner forming a species 
with a, uh, a this is essentially a modified acyllium cation, and in this case, a methyl radical. This gives us the identity of the fragment with mass charge value of 113. This acyllium cation, the similar one here, mass charge ratio of 43. Now, if you uh, leaf back to the mass spectrum of 2 oxanon, you'll notice that this species is much more abundant than this species. I think this, this was certainly less than 10% abundant. And there's two ways of looking at this. There's two um, kind of mechanisms, if, if you like, for reasoning why this is a low abundant species. The first one is that in forming this acyllium cation, we're, form we're forming an attendant methyl radical, whereas when we form this acyllium cation, we're forming a propyl, I'm sorry, a, um, a primary radical as well. So this is, this is a plus, as in addition to, not an electric charge. This, I, I want to clarify here, neither here. This is not an electric charge, this is a plus um, symbol in addition to. So, what we might be thinking is, well, this fragment, its formation is disfavored because it's an acyllium cation and a methyl radical, whereas this is an acyllium cation and a primary radical. And to some extent, that's true. That's certainly true. This is going to have a higher transition state of formation than this, transition state energy. But we can also see that this species can fragment further, and that's another important consideration. This acyllium cation can fragment to form a pentyl cation and carbon uh, monoxide, a, a kind of a real molecule, one of those real molecules that we can produce in a mass spectrum, or a, ma a mass spec experiment. The pentyl cation, mass charge ratio 71, that's certainly detected. That can fragment further to give us a propyl cation, which has a mass charge ratio of 43, just like the acyllium cation, and this uh, fragmentation pan extrudes ethene, Again, another real molecule, closed shell neutral molecule, which we don't detect, but can be produced in this fragmentation process. So that's another reason why this acyllium uh, fragment is not in a high relative abundance, because A, it uh, has a tendent formation of a methyl radical, but B, it can also fragment further. Let's think about another way in which this molecular ion can fragment as well. Because we've accounted for a number of the, uh, the, the fragments that we see in the mass spectrum of 2-octanone, uh, but we haven't accounted for the base peak yet. The base peak was at 58. And the base peak is formed in this species by a, um, a, a certain fragmentation process that is specific to this type of carbonyl group. This fragmentation so, before I go on to name it and, and, and describe it, <coughs> we have to consider different conformations of molecules. It's a, certainly not a, um, an easy thing to, to picture it immediately, but there are different conformations of this, uh, this long chain, even in the gas phase. And another way of drawing the conformation of this molecular ion is this way. And this is an important confirmation because it allows hydrogen transfer from this carbon atom to this oxygen radical cation species right here. This is part of the McClafferty rearrangement. The McClafferty rearrangement is a um, rearrangement, a fragmentation process that occurs in carbonyl groups that feature hydrogens in the gamma position. Remember, we're going alpha, beta, gamma. If we count again, this is the alpha carbon, this is the beta carbon, this is the gamma carbon. The gamma carbon is bonded to a hydrogen atom, two hydrogen atoms, but we're only showing one. This is a gamma hydrogen. So the McClafferty arrangement is specific to uh, carbonyl groups, carbonyl molecules, in fact, that feature uh, gamma protons. In this conformation, we can see how by uh, drawing some single-headed arrows, we can transfer the hydrogen atom the gamma hydrogen atom onto the oxygen. We've formed a, a, a formal cation on the oxygen, and now we have a radical species, an unpaired electron, on this specific carbon atom here. 
that isn't the end of the story because this uh, radical can now go on to uh, induce fragmentation in this species here. This carbon atom, uh, rather this carbon-carbon bond between the alpha and the beta carbon fragments in a homolytic manner. So ultimately, ultimately extrude this, again, neutral closed shell molecule. This is an alkane. I'm sorry, this is a, this is an alkene. It's a carbon-carbon uh, double-bonded species. This is one, two, three, four, five, one pentene, which again, we wouldn't detect because it's uh, neutral. But we're detecting now this radical cation, which has two resonance structures. This is an enol type uh, structure. And we can see that we can draw one resonance structure with a uh, double bond between this carbon atom and the oxygen and a radical localized on this CH2 group here. Or we could draw a resonance structure where we have a carbon-carbon double bond and the radical cation is located uh, kind of entirely on the oxygen atom. We have the radical species on the oxygen and the formal positive charge. But this process here, this McLafferty rearrangement of uh, this molecular ion accounts for the uh, formation of this fragment here, which is our uh, most abundant fragment, and it's the base peak in uh, the mass spectrum of 2 octanon, which we will revisit right now. Our most common molecular ion looks like this, and we used this structure to rationalize the fr its fragmentation. We saw that the low abundance acyllium carbocation at 113 can fragment further to give uh, a series of straight chain uh, carbocations. Whoa, got ahead of myself there. 29 and 15 are methyl and ethyl carbocations. Our base peak is due to the McLafferty rearrangement. I'm only showing one uh, possible resonance structure here. There are, well, there are probably many, but there are two um, important ones. The McLafferty rearrangement is specific to carbonyl compounds containing gamma protons. And we can see that via uh, the other route of alpha fragmentation, or alpha cleavage, we can form an acyllium carbocation, which has a mass charge ratio of 43. And we can also, by fragmentation of this acyllium cation, form a uh, propyl cation, which also has a mass charge ratio of 43. I think I've covered a lot of new material here. And the intrinsic nature of mass spectrometry spectrometry is that it's it's quite an exotic technique to initially get your uh, get your head around it's a high vacuum technique it's high energy and a lot of kind of non-standard chemistry is taking place but we don't need to understand everything that's taking place I think if you watch this video a few times you'll and, and read the uh, chapter in Loudon which is I think chapter 12 is a good chapter uh, to study we'll see that Fundamentally, these steps are not particularly um, difficult to understand. We need to be certain about our usage of double-headed versus single-headed arrows and keeping our math straight and keep thinking about, if necessary, isotope patterns. Also thinking about, um, but really the key is to understand the structure of the most likely molecular ion. And the other thing that we need to think about is what kind of species we're detecting. We can detect cations. We can detect radical cations. We do not detect radicals, single uh, unpaired electron species. And we don't detect neutral molecules, closed shell species, such as water, carbon monoxide, alkenes, things of this nature. Their loss or their, their presence, if you like, has, can be um, inferred, but they will not result in a signal in an EI mass spectrum. I encourage you to uh, watch this video once more before you hit the uh, practice problem set session. I encourage you to work through the practice problems. I strongly encourage you to read Loudon. And I encourage you again, just like I did with NMR, to ask questions all the time. I'm always available. Dr. Esselman is available. Your TA is available. Make use of these resources, and Mass Spec will be your friend. It will provide complimentary information to NMR, and we'll all feel good. <laughs>